I'm going to dumb it down even easier than that. Hemp is good. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Hemp is good. There you go. Hemp is that a fair little summary? Oh my there? God, it's a great summary, okay. and it because it highlights a major issue that currently exists. It's not hard to grow. It grows easily. It grows in difficult environments. It grows with less water, half the water that cotton takes. Um, it actually remediates the soil in ways that other plants don't. Reintroducing it to crop rotation or into fields that it's never been present in actually are good for the soil. So, why Mexico? What is going on? I'm Kay Scholl. Welcome to another financial awareness video. Okay, so same routine as before. Check out the chapter links and check out the timestamp of where the actual interview with Leslie starts. I'm gonna give a quick intro here for this video, but feel welcome to skip ahead because as people love to tell me, I could be long-winded at times and talk in paragraphs, so bear with me. Four things I wanna draw your attention to real quick. Number one, why Mexico? You like that little tease there in the beginning, didn't you? We do talk a little bit about Mexico on this video, but that was a little bit of a tease for the video that's gonna come out after this one, which is specific to INQD and indoor harvest and some potential direction of where the company might go. So you're gonna to wanna to write that one down. Mexico. Number two, why is hemp good? This video is part of your due diligence. In this video, we're going to educate you on the hemp crop, the hemp plant, and the hemp industry, because that is a very real part of your due diligence that you need to be aware of. So hemp is good, and it's going to help not only our society, but our environment and the globe as well, uh, the earth. It's, uh, hemp is good. That's, that's, that is a general thing that you just need to know is that it is good and it should be accepted. Just my opinion. Uh, number three, you're going to hear Leslie in a moment talk about due diligence. So I'm going to run through a quick list here of my due diligence because Leslie talks a lot about first impressions and then also doing due diligence and researching substance and character and then comparing, and then I mentioned in the video, kind of comparing that substance and character to what your first impression was. So I want you to do due diligence and do research on hemp. Here's a quick list of some of the things I've done. I've spoken with a small farmer. I've spoken with a commercial farmer. I've spoken with a lobbyist, an attorney, a lab technician. I've gone into retail stores that sell these products and spoken to clerks. I've spoken to store managers. Um, I have spoken, had a great like 45 minute conversation with a hemp entrepreneur who has products distributed to thousands of locations, not only here in Florida, but throughout the country as well. He's got products that are manufactured in China. He's got labs that he uh, has all of his uh, uh, hemp product or hemp material, uh, hemp crop, you know, tested at. Uh, and so I had a great conversation with him about the industry and some things uh, that he thinks of where it's going. That was really good. I did online research. I did a lot. So at the end of the day, what I want you to take away from, from my due diligence is that it is my opinion that this legal emerging hemp industry is very, very real. In the world of penny stocks, which is where INQD is traded, in the world of penny stocks, there is a very real pump and dump type of trading atmosphere. And so if you are going to consider investing in INQD and in indoor harvest, it is my opinion, you should do your due diligence. And the more due diligence you will do, in my opinion, the more convicted you will be about how this industry is very real. And then as we piece together these puzzle pieces where we're talking about the hemp industry and we're talking about indoor harvest, and we're gonna try to find where some of those things might align and come together. So it is my personal opinion that indoor harvest and the team that runs and operates them this is not a pump and dump scheme. This is a very real company with real people trying to do good things for the globe, for the climate, for the world, and for the emerging hemp industry. So there will be more information that comes out long after this video is made and long after you see this. So your due diligence will have to continue. But again, like I said, due diligence is very, very real. And based on my due diligence that I have done of all these people that I've spoken to, I think that uh, you're gonna wanna be on board this train. 
Just real quick, small farmer, that's my third cousin. You might not know this about me, but on my dad's side of the family, we've been farming uh, a farming family for generations. Uh, when my grandfather passed away in the early 2000s, my brothers and I inherited a small chunk of our family farmland, which we recently sold to our uncle. However, we owned around 100 acres of farmland for about 20, 22 years, and we rotated corn and soybeans. So what did I do when I started to get more involved in my due diligence? I picked up the phone and called my third cousin who farms this land for us and asked him what he thinks. So I spoke with somebody who has boots on the ground that actually is a farmer in the agricultural industry. That was a great conversation. I also had the privilege of calling one of my fraternity brothers whose family has a commercial farming operation. They've been selling um, uh, plants and crops to you know, customers like Home Depot for decades. And they were very fortunate to be literally the first family, the first nursery in the state of Florida to get a legal license to grow cannabis. And they grow for True Leaf. So I am so blessed that in my network of people, I could just pick up the phone, call my fraternity brother who grows for True Leaf, and ask him about what his opinions are about the hemp industry. So that was a great conversation. So all this being said, it is my opinion that this is a very real thing and we need to continue to do research on how INQD and Indoor Harvest will be involved in the hemp industry. But the hemp industry, the legal emerging hemp industry is very real and I invite you to jump on this train. Number four is the final thing I wanna to talk to you about. There are two little nuggets of information that I just wanna draw your attention to. Number one was that Mexico tease at the beginning. You're gonna to wanna to write that one down. Uh, and then number two, you'll see later on in the video, Leslie's tone of voice and his, his, his body language kind of shifts and his tone gets, it just changes. And he talks about something that's fascinating to him. He talks about something that it's his favorite. And he talks a lot about the uh, economies of scale of this one particular potential consumer product. So you're going to want to pay attention to that as well, because in the last video in this series that just came out, we talked about Keith Crouch as the new board member and how he wants to get involved in, in brand building and how he wants to get involved in distribution and consumer products. And so in this video today, we're learning a little bit about what one of those consumer products could be, wink, wink. So pay attention to that part of the video as well, because in my opinion, I think that's a pretty important part of this video today and a part of your due diligence. So all that being said, I would just love to invite you to subscribe to the channel. If you find any value in this video, please hit the like button. That really helps out the channel. Really do appreciate that. And uh, would love to just invite you whenever this video series is over to just come back to the channel, check out, we've got some great personal finance videos about taxes, tax bracket management, Roth IRA versus traditional, lots of great videos. So all that being said, I hope you enjoy this video and I will see you in the next one. What is going to come first? Technological advancements in the recycling of plastic goods or the adoption of hemp into multiple industries? Hemp, hemp the adoption of hemp into multiple industries. Only because the recycling of plastic goods it, 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 like it, it's, yes, it may happen, it probably should happen, but the, that sort of genie is out of the bottle already. The plastic is already in the earth, it's already in the water, and trying to find ways to, to bring it out and remediate it is just going to be... Difficult. Yeah, and it's a diminishing industry, right? Why is it that people are not making uh, piano benches as an industry? Well, because piano ownership is going down. And the future of piano ownership in the traditional sort of piano, that's going to, it's its not going to continue to expand. It's going to decrease. So why would somebody go into the piano bench making business as a diminishing industry? Why is somebody going to go into the plastic remediation industry when it's going to be a diminishing industry? Because hemp and bioplastics, hemp plastic is so much, so much superior, so superior to hydrocarbon based plastics for so many reasons. One, it doesn't really, even when you're remediating by uh, uh, hydrocarbon based plastics, you're still dealing with benzene and toluene and other types of carcinogens and neural disruptors and endocrine disruptors that are horribly toxic and we should never come into contact with. And hemp does not create that problem. Two, whether or not you believe in anthropogenic global warming or not, burning fossil fuels and releasing heavy metals into the air and carbon dioxide and things like that 
change adding all that extra carbon dioxide probably not good the more we start to create plastics out of hemp it has the possibility and the likelihood of creating the largest carbon negative industry to counterbalance the effect we have created with uh, fossil fuels so again it, it just makes so much more sense to be looking at the bioplastics industry and again we have great people to rely on Henry Ford in the in the 1940s built a car mostly out of bioplastic and he said bioplastics which were largely hemp based are far superior to steel and so many other things when manufacturing automobiles which is why we're seeing companies like BMW and Mercedes currently start using hemp plastics in their automobile manufacture so that's the future is going to be very much in that area and I believe that although we will need remediation of the existing plastics it's not going to be as much of a growth industry as hemp based plastic will I'd like to drill down more onto hemp, if that's if that's okay. With you. Can we go down that that, that yes. topic? Because I'm um, I'm a big I'm a big fan of your three piece suits. I know that today's more casual. It's yes. Saturday. It's yes, the weekend. Yes, yes. More casual. Love the three piece suits, right? Um, how important are first impressions to you? Oh, they're they're critical. First impressions are critical, and I will say this. They're critical, and they've become less important over time. And let me answer why. And then I've got a follow-up. Because I've learned the importance of due diligence, and that the first impression, although it can be very significant, is less important than the actual character that you discover of somebody when you really dig in and do the due diligence on who they are and what they've done. Substance. Because after you get to know them, you could then reference back to those initial impressions and you can ask yourself if the substance, the character, is in line with that impression, right? Correct. So here's my follow-up. I, I want to say one more thing oh, about please. that. Oh, please. Okay, yes. Please keep the follow-up, but yeah. I want to say one more thing about that that's really important. I've also discovered that there are many people who have skills that are both innate and developed to try to be more charming and to develop first impressions for good and for bad. And there are many people who have developed other skills and the first impression is not something that they've spent time on. And which is why you almost need to question your first impression more and this idea of trusting your gut although it's very romantic is less important than the due diligence you do on determining who the person actually is based upon their previous actions and what you can learn because creating a good first impression is something that a person can develop as a skill mm. and they can use it to cover up all sorts of bad things perfect so here's the here's the twist we're going to kind of circle it all back together what would you like in an ideal world what would you like somebody's first impression of hemp to be? For, well, the first impression I would like it to be is based upon what it is, which is a critical global crop for agricultural and ecosystem balance. That's a really big answer, but the simple one is to to recognize its historical and future value immediately. I'm going to dumb it down even easier than that. Hemp is good. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> hemp is good. There you go. Hemp, hemp Absolutely. Is, hemp, is, hemp is good. Spot on. Um, speaking of hemp, right, uh, what informative and educational hemp marketing material is currently being circulated? Because if, if people don't have a first impression yet or they're not as aware of something like hemp as they are the plastics and everything that mm -hmm. that we use um how can we educate people right and, and let me give you a quick example just the other day i spoke with a gentleman named justin swanson he mm -hmm. is an attorney he's involved with the midwest hemp council and on the midwest hemp council's website mm -hmm. they have signs that farmers can purchase to put in their fields that say, don't steal my hemp crop. Because people driving by these fields, they see the cannabis plant, 
they think what they think it is, but really it's just biomass. <laughs> mm-hmm. Or it's, it's just some, you know, non-psychoactive, you know, uh, strain or cultivar. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's got to be some sort of an educational effort, you know, whether it's the Midwest Hemp Council or some coalitions. There's got to be a little bit of a branding effort around the hemp industry in a sense that it is a good thing. It's going to disrupt some markets. But I think the first impression is it's that it's good and that it should be accepted. Okay, so uh, again, we could do an entire two hour conversation about some really important things about this. Let me touch on a couple of important points. The um, propaganda that was used to make cannabis and hemp illegal uh, is globally so endemic that it is, um, it's a cancer we're going to take decades to get rid of, one. Uh, two, the economic effect of that and the consequences of that are so far reaching, most people never even realize what it means. Three, what does it mean? Well, for 70 years, we've been developing pulp paper mills to make paper, for example, and they're a blight on the environment. There's an old story that a friend of mine used to tell me regarding a town that he lived near. He said, you can always tell people from this town because they smell bad. Why? Because there was a paper mill. Mm. And the effluent from the paper mill is so awful that it gets into people's pores in their bodies, and you can smell them because they live in the paper mill town. Yeah. And... It's not like it's not a funny thing. It's a it's a terrible thing. Yeah. And so, um, but there have been seventy years of time developing these technologies around paper, and now it's going to develop around hemp. But it's going to take time. Now, what is and now then go into cannabis and adult use cannabis. Well, cannabis is so much less harm than so many other things that people use for similar things, whether it's medicines or or recreation or whatever. The again, legacy propaganda and disinformation surrounding it. It's gonna take a long time. So now, what does that mean? You talk about councils. Well, we need to have things like discus, and which is an alcohol um, self-regulatory organization that, that has been critical in things like, and I don't know if this was discus, but I know that the alcohol industry's self-regulatory organizations have been critical in eliminating um, teen use. For example, one of the reasons that we've seen a tremendous re- reduction in teen use was because of a program was because of a program put forth by the alcohol industry self-regulatory organizations that promoted the idea of parents talking to their children about alcohol and why they should not, why they should avoid it, and it reduced youth use by some. In incredible number, 80% or so over a period of five years. It was that trade association that did it. But what did that, what did that require? That required the alcohol industry businesses to contribute hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars to create those trade organizations that spent the, those self-regulatory organizations that then spent the time doing the research to determine what do they need to do and then coming up with the ideas, coming up with the strategy, implementing it, and spending the money to do it. It costs money to put those signs in every store and to hold those meetings. And what do we not have yet? The hemp and cannabis industry have still not invested in self-regulatory organizations to educate the populace to reduce harm and misinformation and to stop things that are still a problem in those industries. How do we educate people about hemp and don't go steal my hemp? Is we need to have a public education program with billboards and PSAs, etc. Who's going to pay for that? It needs to be a self-regulatory organization. Who pays for the self-regulatory organization? The industry. They need to contribute hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to do that. We're not quite there yet. Yep. It took the alcohol industry, well, the alcohol industry did it very quickly after the drop of prohibition. We'd like to see a faster action. I think that at some point in the near future, we will see it. I do know that there have been organizations that have given given it a shot, and they're still working on it, And and but there's still a long way to go. Yeah, still a long way to go. Do we want to go into a little bit of education around the hemp plant itself, or is that not appropriate? Do we do we not want to go into that? I think I think going into a little bit of it is okay. All right, so I'm going to take a stab at it here because I've been kind of doing some research, and I I, I kind of want to share that I know a little bit of this research. Yeah, so are amazing. I know, I know, I know right? Um, okay, so you've got a farmer, right? Mm-hmm. Hemp starts at the agricultural 
level. Well, maybe it starts politically, but it starts at the agricultural level, right? You have mm-hmm. to plant the crop. Mm-hmm. You have to plant it, right? And and before you plant it, y- y- you're either a farmer that's going to rotate hemp into your crop rotation, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or you're going to go full fledged and dedicate your fields to be a full time for a period of time. For a period of time, right? And then once you kind of have that ironed out, you have to have a good understanding of what cultivar, what strand, what are you going to grow? Are you gonna grow it for CBD? Are you gonna grow it for seed and feed? Are you gonna grow it for biomass and and the stalk? So I feel like there's a lot that, that, that goes into it, right? You almost have to know a little bit of what the end product is going to be before you plant so that you know who you can sell it to. Okay, so now now you're getting into something that is is that a fair little summary? Oh my there? God, it's a great summary, okay. and it because it highlights a major issue that currently exists. Good, and I, I want to follow that up when you're done with your thought there. So the major issue is the farmers. So how do other industries work? Other industries, it isn't the farmer that makes those choices. Mm. Typically, those choices are made because they go to the buyers ahead of before they plant and they say I'm I'm going to be planting this what should I be planting and the buyer says oh I want corn for ethanol or I want corn for animal feed or I want corn for uh, consumer products or I want corn for organic corn for a high end food product like they say what they want ahead of time and the farmer says oh okay well which ones do you like and so it's a contract. Yeah. So the, the buyer contracts the farmer ahead of time to help reduce farmers' exposure. And also because, you know, people who are in the non-farming part of the business don't want to be in the farming part of the business because there's so much risk in farming. Farming is a, is a tough business. It's very tough. Right? So the way that sort of gets broken up is it's not the farmer that has to do all that research because, like, they have to just know about the growing and et cetera. Right. Now, and this is – hemp is – a very different plant. It's a lot tougher than other plants. A lot tougher than sorghum or flax or so many other bast crops. When even if you're not producing it, even if you're not producing it for for the stalk and for the the fibers, and it's still tough. It's tough on the machines. It's tough. It's like it's hardy, and so it it's hard on equipment. Yeah. As a result, they need to change how their what they invest in their in their in their equipment just to harvest and to deal with it. So the answer to your question is, as the industry matures, those questions will be asked less by the farmer, and will end up being a result of a dialogue between their the next step in the supply chain. Um, that they're dealing with as regards the feedstock they're producing. And I don't mean feed as in feed. I mean just, you know, the feedstock for whether it's for biofuel, bioplastics, right. uh, carbon nanotubes, whatever it might be. So I'm glad that you mentioned the supply chain. Because as I was learning and educating and doing my due diligence mm-hmm. on this new emerging industry, mm-hmm. I... I came to the conclusion relatively quickly there's farmers willing to grow it. Yes. Because of the 2018 Farm Bill, which we can talk yes. about in a minute, we can now do more research. We can now grow it legally. Yep. However, you mentioned how tough and strong the fiber and the stalks are. The processing is not exactly the same as corn or soybeans or other agricultural products, right? Nope. So. You know, this might be new information to you, maybe not, but just, I want to say, maybe a couple weeks ago, hold on, let me get this straight, because uh, I just looked this up recently, Dunn Agro, who is the largest hemp processor in Europe, mm-hmm. just recently announced that they are having their American headquarters in Indiana. So the state of Indiana is now going to have, I wouldn't say the the best but probably one of the newest built hemp processing plants so i think just that in general the fact that that european country excuse me company is making an investment in america and in hemp processing specifically i I think that just speaks volume for the industry that they're making that investment so let's talk about something that's really important so what is the hemp going to be hemp has so many uses 
I remember there was a fellow named John Carpenter that had a company called Bast Labs, B-A-S-T at Labs, and he was developing a decorticator for the hemp plant to provide um, compounds, ingredients for the fracking industry. Who knew? Wow. The fracking industry had certain things that could be used by, by hemp that were critical or could be critical for them for the uh, compounds that they use and their formulas they use in their, in, their, in, their, in, in their business. Anyway, and that's like one very far side of the business. Then there is the processing for, so there's processing for fiber. There's processing for... Um, the flour bio, at the top. The flour at the top. There's processing for seeds. Uh, for seeds, there's processing for um, the compounds to refine it into the the different ingredients: CBD, CBG, CBN, CBDV, and more. The and there's a whole bunch of conversations around that. And then there is the one that I, which is my favorite, 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 and the one I am I find fascinating. And we're about to see be a an absolute massive game changer in the world. And that is the hemp cigarette industry and it's sort of a sleeper people don't really they don't understand what's about to happen with it and the reason why I point it out is this so I don't know what the number is anymore but not that long ago people would say how many CBD products how many different CBD companies are there in the United States and at the time this is like four years ago they'd say oh 2600 it's probably four times that now I don't even know it's a massive number right Little data point. Every CBD company, pretty much without, I can say almost without exception, in the United States that's, that is selling a CBD product that's produced here in the United States, it's based upon the hemp plant, is breaking federal law. Hmm. What do you mean, Leslie? It's under the, yeah, the hemp. Yeah, I'm confused. What do you mean? Work and process hemp extract. When they're processing the plant, to get to those cannabinoids, yep. the amount of THC goes above 0.3% uh, by weight in the processed oil. I see. And at that point, it's not legal federally anymore. I see. So even though they extract the CBD out of it and they sort of you know, put the THC mother, they call it the mother extract or something, they move it to the side, everything that's made on it is now technically sort of in a gray area legally because of that. When you make hemp cigarettes, so hemp cigarettes, his cigarettes are such a, a, a stigmatized word. Well, let's talk about hemp cigarettes. Hemp cigarettes for harm reduction are unlike anything the cigarette industry has ever seen. Vaping, ah, we're seeing a lot of problems with vaping. I mean, we, you know, you, there, there's, what's because in? Because of the oils that they're adding The in. oils, and, and you've got this, a friend of mine who's a chemist used to say, when you heat things, that's when chemistry happens. Well, when you have a heating element of unknown origin, and who knows, ask, ask anybody who's vaping and, and say, hey, what's in the heating element that's inside that? Uh, humana, humana? Like, wow, oh, I, I hadn't thought about that. Well, the problem is those things, you know, heat up to four, five, six, seven, eight hundred degrees, and you have multiple unknown oils in there. What's the chemistry that's happening? And we're wondering why people are developing popcorn lung and these other ailments that are coming from overuse of these vaping devices. So that has not been harm reduction. Smoking hemp cigarettes is harm reduction compared to nicotine and tobacco. Hemp cigarettes never get processed above 0.3% THC because it never processes the flour. Mm. It's still the same dry weight. Mm -hmm. And the economics of that industry are, are unlike anything I've ever seen. A field of one acre of hemp can essentially produce I can't. I don't even want to it's talk okay. about it. No, it's okay. the, the, the numbers are unlike anything I've ever yeah. seen. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Very good. I just wanted to bring up that Dun Agro because that's it, it, it's a recent investment that just you know, and there's going to be more like that. Yeah, and 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 I feel like the more people learn about this industry of hemp, hopefully the more things like that we'll see. Right. Oh, we're, no, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. Like as we see things mature over the next. Period. Just as we see, see things mature, the hemp industry is the size of it 
is growing to be this is the very beginning and the size of it is going to be so massive people don't even understand it still today yeah the global plastics industry is 1.1 trillion dollars global fiber industry is 700 billion dollars global paper industry is 530 billion dollars you're talking about two trillion dollars plus between those three industries alone there's been nothing to disrupt those industries each one of them uh, on the level of the hemp plant ever in their history this is so even if you're talking about getting to 5%, 10% of the size of those industries over decades, you're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars Big in revenue. Yeah. That's going to represent trillions of dollars in ownership value of those businesses, th hundreds of thousands of jobs, tax revenue, etc. It's such unbelievably sea change, a sea change on such a level, on such a level that there have been few things we can compare it to historically. If anything, again, because of the specifics of the hemp plant being kept off the market for 80 years while all these other technologies evolved and now it's being opened up. So it's got all this momentum and all these different changes that are going to be taking place and increasing the influence and the extent of it over that period of time. I like that you mentioned Mexico, Mona, because that was literally my next question, because mm -hmm. they are one of our allies. They are mm -hmm. geographically speaking right to our south and our number one trading partner and our number one trading partner. Why Mexico? Is it because their climate uh, to 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 grow the hemp plant is so good? Is it because their their political climate is uh, on board with hemp? What makes Mexico a good trading partner for the hemp industry? So I mentioned earlier being a contrarian. The things that most people would look at as a negative actually end up being a huge positive. Interesting. So the corruption that exists in Mexico ends up, which it, there, I mean, there is just, you can't avoid it, actually ends up being a positive. The, the um, economic challenges that Mexico has end up being a positive. How? What do you mean, Leslie? Well, because hemp is an, e it, they call it weed because it grows like a weed. It's, it's. I, I, I want you can get saying, multiple crops per year. Per year, and it's and it's not hard to grow. It grows easily. It grows in difficult environments. It grows with less water, half the water that cotton takes. Um, it actually remediates the soil in ways that other plants don't. Reintroducing it to crop rotation or into fields that it's never been present in actually are good for the soil. So, why Mexico?